This is the second part of my long podcast on travel, tourism, and coffee buying. And I'm reading from an article, Globalization and the Commodification of Culture. There's a portion here in the article on standardization and Disneyfication, which I think is very interesting. Um, I think by standardization, I've also heard that termed uh, McDonaldi- M- McDonaldization, the idea that anywhere you go, there would be a McDonald's and you would be comforted by the fact that you could go in and order pretty much the same thing in the same way anywhere. And that standardization I've noticed in a lot of places, especially with Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is just everywhere, and McDonald's and Burger King. For example, in Antigua, Guatemala, you have the option to go eat in the local market, which uh, most tourists do not do, to eat in a local restaurant with local food, and to eat Tigua regional dishes, which a fair number of tourists do. You have restaurants that serve sort of fine cuisine, which many tourists go to, and you have Burger King. I'm not quite sure I've eaten at Burger King once, which I don't really eat Burger King, but I do occasionally in, uh, in Antigua, maybe because of that need for just something different and familiar after eating Poya La Plancha for a week. And I can't remember if there was foreigners or more local Guatemalans there because these global brands are very attractive to locals as well. But they certainly offer the standardization uh, as an option. Wherever you go, you can find one of these places. And I'm told that like Chili's and Olive Garden are incredibly popular. Or they were a while ago in Central America in the main cities, that would be like the hottest spot to go to. So there's some sort of sense that these franchises offer an experience that's sort of elevated compared to what that might be considered here in the United States. I'm not sure. And that's a little different than just the standardization. It's a kind of legitimization through these sort of major brands showing up in places where they weren't before. Disneyland provides commodified, standardized niche tourism in which you can purchase a full experience of rides, Disney characters, photos, and souvenirs. Even though the souvenirs at Disneyland or Disney World are no different than those available at local malls, tourists will pay a premium price for them at a Disney site as they validate the tourist experience and its associated status, a signifier that one has actually been there as the remembered fact of acquisition at the hallowed site invests the purchase with singularity despite its commonplace character. In this way, purchases and advertising also come full circle as the products promote the place, the place promotes the products. Standardization is key to the construction and commodification of tourism with many diverse places becoming more and more alike as a way to handle large numbers of people efficiently and uniformly. Disney is so prominent in presenting such standardization that sociologists have created the terms Disneyfication or Disneyization. Disney allows the tourist family to embrace a standardization yet individualized experience, including vacation packages that provide tourists with choices of specialized meals and activities to meet their own family's interests. Further, as many readers will know from experience, when you make a trip to Disney theme parks, you find that they are, one, efficient, with lots of signage and every action calculated for direction, timing, and effect, two, predictable and orderly, three, clean and tidy with helpful staff, and four, familiar because the characters you encounter, such as Donald or Mickey, are the same as those on television clothing, and in children's books. There is much similarity here with how McDonald's restaurants are organized. In both instances, standardization is about delivering a predictable, familiar product. It is Disney, however, that expands these patterns into the tourist industry. Disney is also an example of how mass tourism commodifies a sense of familiarity with the roles of tourists and hosts predefined. 
The familiarity of the Disney holiday brings with it a feeling of safety. Your children are assumed to be safe. People can speak to you in their own language. You know how much things will cost, and you're guided by planned itineraries. A very similar appeal to comfort and predictability is found in cruise packages, casinos, amusement parks, and resorts. Standardization allows tourists to feel they are experiencing something unique, even when it is not. A novelty experience different from home, but sufficiently familiar to feel safe. Yet the ongoing desire for an authentic experience remains, a desire that is partially resolved through the process of having an authentic experience in commodity form, which brings us back to our purchases. For example, while on tour in Australia, tourists might find a replica of an authentic Aborigine village, or in Canada, visit an exhibit of Aboriginal art. Tourists can then purchase authentic souvenirs, such as jewelry or leather goods. In this way, the sum of the tourist interaction with Aboriginal culture is the act of purchase. A purchase attempts to make the fleeting experience of tourism real and material. So if purchasing some sort of Disney doodad after visiting Disneyland as a way to make the experience more concrete and more permanent, plus to have something to come home and show and talk about your experience, uh, to demonstrate that you were actually there and this is the cool thing you bought. I think that is quite similar to the way coffee purchases work when you pick up some coffee or other tourist items in an airport uh, shop on the way home, maybe because you forgot to get something when you're out in the hinterlands or wherever you were on your trip. And it's some way to hold on to these memories to demonstrate where you were to people as beside your photographs and your plethora of Instagram posts. It also reminds me that, especially in the 90s and early 2000s, I remember a lot of coffee packaging, even Starbucks coffee packaging, having themes and motifs, sort of abstract designs of the place where a certain coffee was from. So if it was from Costa Rica, it would have the birds of Costa Rica on the packaging a uh, pattern from Toraja for a Sulawesi coffee, for example. There was a way that the coffee packaging kind of stood in for the place, perhaps like a postcard would. And it led me to think about the fact that purchasing a pound of coffee that is decorated or dressed up in the costume of the country is a little bit like the it's a small world after all approach to cultures of the world. And I'll talk a little more about it's a small world after all. In a way, buying a coffee from uh, Costa Rica, for example, from Starbucks, would be not only a way to remember a, a trip in the distant past and keep that alive, the fact that you went to this place and you liked it and, oh, the coffee was so great and I wish I could have that coffee and, oh, look, Starbucks has that coffee. But perhaps also it's another travel experience. <laughs> you don't actually have to go to the place. And many people haven't visited all the places where Starbucks sources their coffee from. In a way, you can travel the world through these purchases. Perhaps they just like the look or like the style, or they like the fact that it's from that place. And of course, there's many stores that cater to that. Um, Cost Plus comes to mind as a place in our area that has goods from all over the world and you sort of vicariously travel to these places through your purchases and bring them into your life. And that ends up saying something about you and who you are, about what you value and uh, your experiences or non-experiences. I see that less and less now that the coffee packaging would have motifs from the country. I think now the purchasing of the coffee is more about the belief and identification with the, uh, the company and the brand. The kind of tribalistic way people follow particular coffee roasters like Stumptown or Blue Bottle or Intelligentsia is the thing that's reified the belief that is strengthened through the purchase. So for me, when I think of Disney and I think of culture and coffee, 
The first thing that comes to mind is It's a Small World After All, the exhibit in Disneyland, California. In our family, we had the the record as well, the It's a Small World After All record that we'd listen to over and over again. If you haven't had the pleasure of visiting the It's a Small World ride, I will recite the lyrics for you now. It's a world of laughter, a world of tears. It's a world of hopes and a world of fears. There's so much that we share that it's time we're aware. It's a small world after all. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, There is just one moon and one golden sun, and a smile means friendship to everyone. Though the mountains divide and the oceans are wide, it's a small world after all. Repeat, repeat, endlessly. Repeat song, endlessly. (laughs) Um, If you've been on the ride, you're, you're basically trapped on this boat as it goes excruciatingly slow through this ride and you and so many people complain that it's an incredibly annoying world after all Um, it was a ride that was created in the wake of the cuban missile crisis actually and it was built in disneyland's um, studio lot and first shipped um, to the unicef section of the new york world's fair in 1964 and it was sponsored by Pepsi. The song itself is considered to be the most played song ever in history. 2014, it was estimated that the song had been played nearly 50 million times worldwide in the attractions alone, beating the radio and TV estimates for You've Lost That Love and Feelin' and The Beatles Yesterday, which were believed to have been played only eight and seven million times, respectively. It seems like the value placed on a lot of tourist experience and travel has to do with this authenticity. That's the kind of currency that we're talking about. On one end of the spectrum, the very safe, predictable, and guided Disneyland-like experience, or saying, wow, this trip sucks, it's just like Disneyland. But, you know, it's also very relaxing, so you got to give it that. You know, on the other hand, there are people who travel in coffee and document it and want to represent themselves as being extremely innovative, nomadic, far off the beaten path, much like the backpack traveler. And yet they're staging certain things for cameras. Um, They're creating material. They're posting to their Instagram and social media. And ultimately they sell a product. They're building authenticity for themselves, for their brand, and for the merchandise they sell. So in coffee travel, there may not be a product directly related to that trip that you buy, but it attaches a value to the product that you will eventually sell people. And you're building that credibility and authenticity as you do this. A couple of quick searches online for brand and storytelling results in the term story selling. And this is something that's been happening a a long time. I think Starbucks was one of the companies that laid some groundwork for this in coffee. One time uh, back in 2008, a long time ago, I was traveling in Sulawesi and I stopped at a coffee mill that sells to Starbucks. And they had a bag of Sulawesi coffee that a Starbucks buyer had probably brought back with them. It was from this era of the sort of origin themed package with, you know, Indonesian motifs and, you know, really dipping into this idea of dressing the package in the costume of where it's from, like it's a small world. This was the text that was on the package. I don't think people do this anymore. They wouldn't be so bold as to literally attach a story to a coffee bag. But I think somehow implicitly, it's still there. We had driven into the jungle for hours, crossing riverbeds and rice fields, hitting nearly every bump along the way. The driver of the rusted Land Rover turned to me as we passed a thick bamboo forest and grinned. This is as far as I took the National Geographic people. I smiled back, wondering how much farther we would go. Hours later, we stopped at a small market town in northern Toraja. 
Children ran toward us, interested, no doubt, by the novelty of a vehicle and its passenger from the west. It was market day, and villagers displayed their goods. Their voices sang like birds as I passed by their dried fish, spices, and peppers. I came upon a farmer with green coffee, carried in fresh from his village. This was what I had hoped to find, the flavor of a distinct village's coffee. Discoveries such as this inspired our latest offering, Kopi Kampung Sulawesi, Indonesia. This is written by Dub Hay, chief coffee buyer. It's hard not to crack up a little reading that in a way. If you've watched Seinfeld, you remember the J. Peterman catalog and uh, the stories they had, they, they bought from Kramer. But really, this is kind of a colonial mythology. It's the subjectivity and the narrator is this person from the West who's traveling out into the land of the other. It's so over the top. It's so Indiana Jones. It's pretty laughable at this point. Having traveled in this area, it's a narrative that sounds like it belongs in maybe the 1900, 1920, and even there, there would be missionaries all over Toraja area. So seeing somebody from the West is not extraordinary. And the idea in, if this was written in the 90s or early 2000s, that people from a village in Toraja would be amazed by a vehicle <laughs> is preposterous. But this is what you need to do to create a narrative with this sort of white male at the center and the other staged as these strange childlike people. So this belongs to a certain era of coffee marketing, but this same theme is sort of reprised in a program called Dangerous Grounds that came out about 2012. This program is was on the Travel Channel and it features in the role of Dub Hay, this gentleman, Todd Carmichael from La Colombe, which was a very ambitious and growing company that I think eventually was either purchased or, or partnered with Chobani Yogurt. If you visit the IMDb page for Dangerous Grounds, you're going to see the show trailer. In this, Todd Carmichael is crouched on the ground in a market in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, hovering over a pile of green coffee that he, with his expert coffee buyer experience, determines to be low quality. But he pulls out a map, person selling the coffee, circles the area, and that's on the map where the coffee is from. And that's his next clue of where to go. But quickly he must escape the market because Port-au-Prince is dangerous and he's been there a little too long. He's got to keep moving to find the coffee. All right, well, this is coffee. You can look at tomatoes and tell if they're rotten or not, right? I'm looking at tomatoes and they're rotten. Between you and I, this is just undrinkable. This, as you can tell, looks like rotten back teeth. The fruit was never pulled off and let it dry in the sun. And what you're going to find inside here is going to taste rancid. Tu me vends de café? Okay. Okay, I just asked him if I could buy two pounds of coffee because... I don't want to insult the guy. Coffee guys are pretty sensitive people. I know I am. No one likes my coffee. It breaks my heart. So I'm going to buy two pounds of his. Clearly, this is not the greatest coffee in the world. But I'm trying to salvage something. At least know where we can find other coffees. The crime rate in Port-au-Prince is off the charts. We're starting to get a lot of attention, but we don't want it. I think we pushed our luck far enough. Let's get out of here. So it's got this sort of stranger danger music in the background. And the idea about the market being dangerous is something dubbed in later because he's got to spice up the narrative that Dub Hay might have told in the 1990s with uh, something more exciting that shows that he's truly off the charts in terms of his travel route. He is the backpacker. He's the adventurer. He's the conqueror out there navigating the dangers of the world in order to find the coffee. 
So, you know, for the viewer of this program, there's this exciting experience that they can participate in from the safety of their home, while Todd Carmichael does all the dangerous work. The funny thing here is what he's doing in order to find quality coffee is, to a, a green coffee buyer, absolutely ridiculous. The idea that you would go to a local market, talk to someone in order to find a source for good coffee uh, on this kind of trail, this exciting uh, adventure, just is pure fiction. If you knew there was good coffee in an area, you would contact an export or association, you would have received some samples, you would follow up with those samples, you would find a growing association, find a cooperative, get in touch with them, tell them you wanted to visit, you would arrange something, they would help you get there, you would come at the right time when the coffee was ready. And of course, some of the, the information he's giving, he just says this coffee looks like bad teeth. He says something like uh, it wasn't picked and dried right. And it's like, I know what he's sort of trying to say, but it doesn't really make sense. Anyway, here's the summary for the program. Would you risk your life for the perfect cup of coffee? Todd Carmichael would. As owner of La Colombe Torrefaction, a premium coffee company based in Philadelphia, he travels the globe, sleeping under his car, avoiding warlords and bodily harm, risking it all to bring back the perfect cup of joe. His business focuses on the best, coffee so rare it's sought by the world's top chefs and restaurants. Carmichael seeks out the most exotic, fascinating and dangerous places to find the perfect seed in the coffee plant. There's an amazing story behind every cup. So if I had to characterize the world as this scary, dangerous place where white men go out and brave, brave it all in order to bring back the prize, I kind of prefer it's a small world after all of seeing the connection and similarity between people, even if you're sort of fudging the lines. Not that that's a good option, but this is the xenophobia that's inherent in this sort of program is a much worse option. And it's, you know, really racially charged. In order to realize this heroic characterization of himself, he's going to basically throw everybody else under the bus. Situations have to be dangerous. People have to become shifty and untrustworthy they're characters in his drama, and he can represent them any way he wants to in order that the show is exciting and gains an audience. It's extremely comic. Um, I had an early version of this that I had pulled from YouTube. Before he actually had the program, it seemed like he was going out and shooting these adventure coffee sourcing videos in order to attract a production company. And in one of them, he actually does roll under a truck because they've gone driving out to the hinterlands in the dark in Haiti. And so he has his sleeping bag and his camping light and his survival gear. And he lays down on the ground and rolls underneath a truck as shelter to sleep. And so he's not seen. So he's protected. My God, it's insane. This is purely a figment of someone's imagination. Like, why would you do these things? There's another scene where he's sort of stomping across a river to get to the coffee, the good coffee that he sees on the hillside above. And there's clearly other ways to get across this river than walking directly through it and wetting your shoes for the rest of your hike. It's just not sensible activity. He has other things where he goes into local markets with wads of cash that he's brought to purchase coffee, which nobody would ever do. We wire transfer from one bank to another to pay for our coffee. We don't pay for it on the spot. We pay for it later when we receive a pre-shipment sample. So it's all this fantasy about a kind of business that doesn't exist. But other people have to be these characters in his story, and the plot needs to be modified from what actually happens in coffee buying to something else, something exciting and something dangerous. But these two examples with the Dub Hay Starbucks text from the 90s and the Todd Carmichael adventure story from the 
2012, 2013, show the lengths people will go to in order to warp the world around this strange vision of the West, the global North, in order to create a business narrative. I suppose it's not unlike many Instagram posts where people crop out everything else except themselves on a beach as if they're alone having this wonderful experience. It's these extreme representations that have no checks and balances with reality. I'll say that I've actually seen this in group coffee travel to rural areas. I've participated in some of these events where it's sort of 10 coffee buyers on a bus. And strangely, you show up at a farm, everyone kind of scatters and does their selfies as if they're the only person there, cropping out every other coffee buyer. It's as if people want to represent this way that they're out there on their own. So you don't have to go to the links of a Todd Carmichael and portray the world as full of dangers that you must navigate in order to find the fine coffee in order to change the representation of what your coffee sourcing trip is like. It seems obvious that the thing that connects the Starbucks text by Dub Hay and the 2012-2013 Dangerous Grounds narrative is that these are men competing to go further, do more, and exceed what other people have done, supposedly for the great cup of coffee, but really to build the brand and to build an image so that they can sell product. I think since that time, things have changed quite a bit, and the narratives aren't so much the traditional travel narratives about their farmer connection and their source, but it's more a narrative about themselves, about their company. By the way they describe themselves, you think they were primarily a social mission. In fact, selling the coffee too directly seems crass. So what you really want to do in this day and age is sell the goodness of your company, build your brand and build loyalty so that the coffee will just sell itself. I'm looking at a San Francisco company. It's called the statement about their coffee is really something you might read from a social project or a non-for-profit. For coffee isn't mundane or commodity. It isn't just coffee. It has a quality to bring joy to life through its aromas and flavors, but also with its ability to bring people together. There is a world and a story behind every coffee from particular people, places, and cultures. We travel to build real relationships with our producers around the world with a commitment towards quality through direct relationships, but also because of a commitment to connection and quality of life from the farms to your cup. Founded by Kevin in 2013, is the evolving dream for the experience of coffee towards a simple joy in life, but also towards social connection and celebration of people, places, and cultures. Kevin discovered that small-scale poor farmers produced some of the most complex and incredible coffees in the world, yet they had no experience of what was happening to their work thousands of miles away or its tremendous value and appreciation by specialty coffee drinkers. Their sourcing story has this to say is a rare coffee company that works exclusively through committed and developing relationships with small-scale producers to create value and transformation at origin while aiming to bring that same transformative energy to customers. This is under a title called Relational Sourcing. So the interesting things here is how they position themselves as being singular, that they are the only company developing relationships with small-scale coffee producers. That's news to me. I think that's actually, with independent coffee roasters, the dominant way of working to source your coffee. But it's a way that everyone can claim, I suppose, that they are singular and distinct. So it seems like the competition to kind of one-up everyone else isn't to go further, do more, go beyond where the National Geographic people went, go to the most dangerous place. It's to be pure, more saint-like in the way you do things. And really you do it not to get coffee because you sell coffee. So it's simply like 
how, you don't have anything to sell unless you buy coffee. So buying coffee isn't like a heroic act, is it? It's just simply getting the thing that you need to sell so you can continue to have your economic enterprise. But in this case, it's sort of transformed into some act of goodness. And to do that, you need to portray coffee farmers as being, to sum up what they're saying, is poor and ignorant, poor and disconnected from the the rest of the world. And to me, this is not really a fair representation of coffee farmers. Pretty much every coffee farmer I know has a cell phone and is on the internet. So they can research and understand where their coffee goes. Not that they have time to do that because their part in the sort of coffee supply chain is to grow coffee, not to spend all their time looking at how it's being sold. But it, it represents them as somebody in need of Kevin, in need of to come to make things good, to make it equitable for them to grow coffee. He discovers them. And that's very much the same as both Dub Hay and Todd Carmichael. They go out and they discover coffee farmers. And I don't think that's a good representation of the work to source coffee. The coffee farmers are pretty easy to find and connect with. And sometimes you locate good sources for coffee by tasting samples. And sometimes you find it through relationships with other coffee farmers in the area who sort of connect you with somebody. But there's an abundance of good coffee, actually, in the world. Um, It's really not hard to find good coffee, actually. A lot of the difficulty is that you need to buy a certain volume of coffee in order to make it work. So if you only need three bags of coffee and you want to go find your own Guatemalan coffee, that's going to be difficult. If you buy 300 bags, it's not going to be hard to go choose individual coffees and and to have them imported into the U.S. for you. There's nothing that mysterious. These places are not hard to get to. It's not hard to locate good coffee. They use the term relational sourcing, and this has been a kind of buzzword lately, and I don't know where it came from. Maybe somebody did a talk at one of the coffee meetings about transactional approaches versus relational approaches. It's actually really kind of old um, material and buzzwords. And it basically comes from marketing language. Transactional marketing means, you know, someone walks in your store, you sell them something, you're interested in a kind of short-term investment and short-term reward in your customer. And relational means that you want to build loyalty and have them return to you based on an investment that you make in the relationship. But both of them, in the end, are about selling something to somebody. And in fact, for small companies, what you want to do is get people to believe in your brand so that you don't have to keep explaining yourself uh, and selling to them over and over again. You'll lose those customers anyway because they'll just find it cheaper somewhere else. So investing in relational marketing is really just a self-protective mechanism to have people return to you and you don't have to keep investing work all the time in maintaining that customer relationship. In terms of sourcing, um, it would be the same thing. You can't go every year and find a whole new set of coffees to buy that are the same good quality as last year. It's much easier to return to the same sources and repeat the business you did the year before and get good quality. Again, I don't think there's anything heroic about this. You need to find good coffee. And it makes a lot of sense to go each year to the same people you buy from and try to repeat the quality that you had last year. In this sort of world where the narrative shifts from this adventure story of going out to wrangle coffee from the uh, others, in this model, it's about valorizing everything as in the sort of wrapper of a social mission when what you're doing is basically capitalism. You're selling products. So one of the problems I find in the coffee trade is it's difficult for people to talk critically or to discuss ideas or the framework that we're operating in because it always kind of gets subsumed by this idea that everyone's sort of jockeying for position and competing with each other. 
and definitely in coffee, just like a, in Sweet Maria's and probably every company, is that there's a tendency for people to want to be more right-minded than other people. And I think it's probably fair to look at this conversation I'm having <laughs> with all five of you out there that could be an interpretation of this too. The fact is, I don't really know how else to go talk and tell about sourcing coffee. I think it is interesting. We want to have a transparency in how we do things. We want people to see what our activity is. You know, an unfortunate side effect of businesses like ourselves wanting to be transparent and reveal how we source our coffee, um, what's behind the product, so that our customers can be informed about who we are and what we do and where coffee comes from, is that the transparency itself becomes yet another thing that companies compete against each other with. I don't know what to do about that. And I don't really think there's an answer if you want to say what you're doing, how you're working, and where your coffee's from. I don't think there's a correct way to tell about it, to photograph it, and to be open about it. What I do think is possible is to challenge some of the narratives, to play around with them, to create new narrative forms to talk about coffee, to kind of widen the frame, while the impulse might be to zoom in on one aspect, those classic photographs of the farmer holding cherry in their hand, the coffee flower on the tree, the person picking the coffee. It's to look in another direction to show something else, to complicate the picture, to show other forms of labor. I remember when I took my first coffee trip for Sweet Maria's. It was to Guatemala back in 2001. It was like four years after I started the company. And I was so wound up. I was so excited to go. But I probably wasn't in the best frame of mind to learn and experience and sort of be open to a new place. I think it was a combination. I really wanted to just take everything in. But I also had this really strong need to show what I know, to kind of validate myself and the business because I felt small and insignificant and invalid. I think one of the greatest things about being a tourist or traveling for coffee is experiencing that vulnerability, the feeling of being unfamiliar, that you're somewhere where other people know what they're doing and you're not sure, and you need help and direction. And for me, that's part of what makes travel so unlike being at home I feel like trying to bring that vulnerability and the feeling of not knowing but wanting to learn into my travel is an important part of being a good traveler and a good guest and a good tourist. And I think about some of the trips I've taken where I needed to prove something or some of the different ways I've seen other people travel in coffee. It doesn't really leave much space for that type of learning that can come when you aren't the expert and when you don't know and when you need to find out. What's nice about doing new things, going somewhere new, is there's always this possibility that you will learn something that you can bring back with you and it will shift how you understand things. Well, it's always possible. <laughs>